Well, thank you. It's fantastic to be down here in Adelaide. Uh, I'm a massive footy fan. Uh, so any other towns that love AFL, I'm with you. It's fantastic. Although I'm a Carlton boy, so it probably doesn't win me any points in anywhere. Let's just put it that way. Um, uh, as we shared, I work with Questioning Christianity. If, uh, if you jump on the website, you can get links. Actually, all our stuff really is on social media. And so YouTube, a ton of short videos, really processing any of the big questions you probably have been asked and hope you don't have to give an answer to. Uh, we've just got things helping people process that and really put for outsiders and newcomers as well that you can share with them. So please do go and check that out. But this series on Burnt, I think, is phenomenal. Why people give up on the church and leave the faith. It's something we really need to process in the aftermath of COVID with church numbers dropping in many places around the country. And as people are reassessing, where does the church and my belief in Jesus fit in the changing landscape of life and the pressures and everything like this? And when it comes to the kind of concerns that people have around Christianity, that's not a short list. The church is too political or not involved enough in social affairs. The church has all these difficult doctrines that don't quite make sense. Or the church has this ancient view of ethics that seem restrictive or repressive. All of these I face in every Q&A at schools and at universities all the time. But this topic, when leaders fall, I've noticed this trend amongst the questions that I get and the concerns that I hear from people's hearts, that the biggest reason why they seem to be walking away from Christianity or not considering Jesus in the first place is because of the pattern of Christians behaving badly, of people that have been hurt by the church or feel in many ways like they've been betrayed by those who they looked up to. Uh, When I became a Christian, my youth pastor at this church where I started attending, I had all these questions for him. Uh, I became a Christian, but I didn't check my brain at the door of the church. I was encouraged to worship God with my mind. And so I had a whole range of things that I wanted to make sense of. And he gave me a list of books, about 50. And a number of the books on that list were by a guy named Ravi Zacharias. I loved reading these books. I picked up a bunch of his old MP3s, you know, the write, save, click, as, online, old school internet dial-up times. And, uh, and I just listened to everything I could by him. By print and by podcast, this guy became almost as a spiritual father, a mentor from afar, the gifts of our modern technology. And then after being a pastor for a number of years, I had the opportunity to go and study a year in Oxford at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, a centre which was actually run by the European branch of Ravi's team. And I loved it. It was there that I got to meet so many of the people that I admired and had looked up to from afar, and including Ravi, who came a few times that year. And at the end of that year, I was actually invited to join his international team of evangelists and apologists to become an RZIM dude. Originally in America, I said no, and then they said, well, what about starting something in Australia? I said, sounds great. We were pregnant at the time, heavily embedded in ministry, so let's, let's get that going. And over then six years on that team, it was such a rich spiritual family. And Ravi was someone who I came to admire, not just from a distance now, through the pen or through the printed word, but now also in person. You got to see his quality, who he was, and he was someone that I deeply admired. So I'll never forget then the shock, the day that the Christianity Today article broke, that after his death, maybe five or six months after he'd gone, all of a sudden these allegations came to light, credibly reported on, detailed testimony from the people who had been abused with horrendous accounts of what they'd endured by his hand. Reading the story, my wife looked at me and she just said, I feel sick. I can't believe it, this predatory behavior and the way that it had torn apart so many lives and that feeling like a giant, a spiritual person that you admired so deeply now had fallen so far. Someone who'd been admired universally at his death, now being reviled openly and publicly for what had been done. Now, this message is not designed to be one on church abuse. That's coming for a much more qualified voice in a couple of weeks. But I want to take this very personal upfront account of what I had to go through and and use this as an opportunity to look at a broader challenge. Is the fall of so many leaders that we once looked up to. Just in the last week, the independent guidepost report into abuse within the Southern Baptist Convention was launched, an entire litany of crimes exposed, of people who had destroyed lives under their care, 
We see stories of pastors' duplicity all the time. They betray who they have been publicly. Here in Australia, the Hillsong giant is now starting to fall. The movement starting to shatter around the world. For those who listen to the rise and fall of Mars Hill with someone like Mark Driscoll, again, who rose to meteoric fame in terms of his global influence in the evangelical movement, but then exposed in various ways as being someone who hurt those under his care. I think of Bill Hybels, a father of much of the church growth movement, modeling a view of Christian leadership. I mean, these were the people whose books filled my shelves as an aspiring public Christian, as a pastor. And their podcasts and music, they filled our ears and our hearts. And all this in the last 10 years just seems like hypocrisy runs so deep in the leadership circles, at least of evangelical Christianity. And if you're anything like me, it's hit with something of a percussive force. You feel like there's a whiplash in 10 years of all the people who we used to headline the conferences that we'd go to. Now we're not, why do we even go to these conferences? Is all this just a fake show? Is all of this just about wearing masks? For those who were close to these people, there's that experience of feeling utterly betrayed by a spiritual mentor or a pastor or that family friend. And at a distance, it's very easy to understand why there's this disillusionment generally amongst people as they look towards the church. They're tempted to give up on the church and so often end up walking away from Jesus. So what light does the Christian story shed on this dark reality? Well, as you might expect, over the last couple of years, I've tried to dig down and unearth the various layers behind when leaders fall. I mean, at first there was this layer of shock. I felt like I knew Ravi. Beyond just at a distance, and it's not just about putting someone on a pedestal, but as a mentor, as a friend, as someone for whom I had this deep admiration, and I found myself asking the question, how could he, this person that I thought I knew, do something like that? That shock gives way to grief when you consider the disastrous fallout of when leaders fall. Of those who were most affected, their lives ripped apart. And in Ravi's case, a global ministry completely destroyed. The gospel brought into public disrepute as someone who used to defend it in the secular spaces. And I asked, why would God let this happen? Then the various levels of doubts that we might be tempted to raise. The man I thought I knew was nothing like the monstrous things that would finally emerge in the independent report. And it led me to ask a series of difficult questions. What was real out of all of my experiences with him? And what was fake? What was just a mask that was put on? And if that's something that people can do so proficiently, then how can we trust anyone in Christian leadership? Should we be looking up to people or not? Perhaps an even scarier question, if there's so many of these Christian leaders falling, does the gospel really work in bringing about a transformation of the human heart? Or is this just some pyramid Ponzi scheme? How do you preach so powerfully when you're walking in such darkness? And then those threads that are embedded in your own life, what do we make of the person's influence that they once had in our world? Practically speaking, what do I do with Ravi's books? Do I keep them in my shelves? The argument standing on their own two feet is a reflection of real truth? Or as I teach apologetics at a university level, do I have to expunge every reference to him and burn these books out of a concern that, well, now it's framed in a very hurtful way? That someone else who has been hurt by a leader might walk into a library and see these names and feel like that's not a safe place for them anymore. That your entire message has been undermined by the inability of the messenger to go along with it. And what of all the memories, all of those sweet things and experiences that you've had, of that deposit that they've played in your life, a dark shadow is cast over all of it. And then there's that next step of activism, the confrontation. How? How did this take place? Has the church fostered these masks that we wear? Have we elevated gifting over character? And what role have I played in perpetuating systems like that? Now, these are not the exhaustive list of questions that we need to ask, but I raise them to say I completely sympathize with people who have become disillusioned with the church because of the failure of so many leaders. 
Now, pouring into the scriptures, maybe the first thing that I discovered is this global sifting. This isn't of the enemy. This isn't Satan exposing these things. This is God's work. You see, where we might be tempted to ask, man, what is going on as we survey the landscape right now? Well, unlike institutional cover-up, God does not sweep religious evils under a rug, but he's in the habit of dragging them out into the open to be dealt with. As you read through the New Testament, nearly every letter that's there is because of the beliefs or the behaviors of a certain church did not frame God and the gospel right. They'd wandered off the script that Jesus had so beautifully painted with their lives. And individuals as well as churches are memorialized forever for their failure to live up to the high calling when Jesus gives to us. There has never been a more vocal critic of religious hypocrisy than Jesus. To some of the leaders in his day, he called them whitewashed tombs. Meaning like much of the evangelical media machine, there is this renovated exterior designed to look perfect and beautiful and to sell when internally it is just dead men's bones, a moral and spiritual corpse. And perhaps encouragingly to those who have been harmed, the strongest words of judgment on the lips of Jesus were not reserved for notorious sinners or prostitutes or murderers or drunkards. The strongest words of judgment from Jesus were reserved for religious leaders who were misrepresenting God to those whom he loves. Jesus doesn't remain silent about religious evils. He speaks up, which is something why his half-brother James in the New Testament writes in James 3.1, Brothers, not many of us should seek to be teachers, for we who teach shall be judged more strictly. And so these ugly truths coming to light, it's God's work. And it's not driven because God hates these people. It's driven because he loves them. Leaving leaders in sin in their own private lives allows them to be killed internally. And leaving leaders in sin is a cancer to the churches and the ministries that they will ultimately lead. And what I noticed as I was reading through the New Testament is that as Jesus exposes this hypocrisy, as these leaders fall, not all of these falls are the same. Take three New Testament examples. Judas, called to be one of Jesus' apostles, trusted to handle the common purse, displayed an outward righteousness, but one that only covered up an inner darkness. And when it became financially beneficial... To out Jesus, to betray him. That was the path that he took. Like the Pharisees that Jesus described as the whitewashed tombs, for Judas, this religious path was merely a means to a different end. One to gain some degree of power or social influence or wealth. And when finally exposed, it didn't drive him to a godly repentance to turn back and to trust in Jesus. Merely a worldly sorrow at how far he'd fallen. One that led him eventually to take his own life. It's a tragic story. And these sorts of leaders that get into the religious game simply to become a platform for their own success or an elevation of their own brand or name. They may even preach the gospel, we're told in Galatians 1. But it doesn't mean that they themselves have entered into it. That you can talk about Jesus without actually knowing him. And you hear of that terrifying statement that Jesus makes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, but they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus, did we not in your name perform many miracles and even cast out demons? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of evil, for I never knew you. Jesus warns that this is a true diagnosis of some people in ministry leadership, one we should be watchful for, careful for. Then there's Demas, 
this minor figure in the New Testament. He's brought up a couple of times as a missionary alongside Paul, one well spoken of as a co-laborer with Paul. Colossians 4, 14, Philemon 1, 24. A genuine evidence in Paul's eyes of there being this beautiful gospel work of a rich web of relationships amongst different church leaders. And yet in 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says that Demas deserted me to go into Thessalonica. And he gives the reason for this desertion. He says, because he loved this world. It's reminiscent of Jesus' teaching of the four soils, one that grows up quickly but ultimately is choked by other cares, by other desires, by this worldliness. Something real had grown up. As you look, this really is who he is. But at some stage in his ministry, he was tempted down a different path by a different kind of love. And for those in varying points of ministry leadership, it's not that easy. <laughs> I mean, I get to go to different places. I meet a lot of pastors. They face all kinds of different challenges. Ministry is difficult. It's tiring. Often it's thankless. Everyone is putting their shared burdens onto your shoulders. And it can be so easy for these leaders that rather than looking to the Spirit, rather than looking to their Savior, instead they open up a door to sin, to run into a quick and easy comfort where one inch across that line justifies the next and the next and the next, until they look back and barely recognize who they have become. A love for the world chokes out their love for Jesus, and they become something else altogether. And then there's Peter, the spokesperson for the apostles, Jesus' inner circle, a guy who makes this wonderful confession. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Peter. It's ticks. Finally, after all of Peter's failures, a big tick, things are on the up from him. And, and Peter goes from these mountaintop moments as part of Jesus' inner circle, of a seeing Jesus transfigured before his eyes, go supernova with the glory of God, then to the greatest failure of his life, leading into a dark night of the soul, where Luke's gospel records that just as Jesus warns that he's about to be handed over to the Gentiles and to be killed, Peter says, no. Nah. Jesus, I will follow you. Even if everyone else walks away, I will never deny you. And Jesus says in Luke's gospel, Peter, Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. There's a time of testing that's coming. And Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You read as the Gospels describe what happens on the night where Jesus is betrayed and captured and imprisoned. It's a dark scene. And Peter fails three times. Aren't you one of his followers? That moment of temptation to give in to comfort, to security, rather than to stand for Jesus. And he gives in. Describes... And again, in Luke's gospel, that at the moment the cock crowed three times, from across the courtyard, having just denied Jesus, he catches eyes with his Savior. To think of that sense of failure. Jesus warned it. You denied it. Now, I'm going to be able to be strong enough to stand for Jesus. And then you fall in an epic way. He runs out weeping into the darkness. It's the last time he sees Jesus. Jesus is killed. He spends a shadowy Sabbath mourning his own failure. Imagine Peter recounting this story to the other disciples. Peter, weren't you the strong one out of all of us? You were the one that was meant to stand where everyone else fell. And look, you've given in. And so not all hypocrisy is the same. Not all falls are the same. Judas never was one of them, and the sin exposed what was always true. Demas seemingly was one of them, but was tempted away, choked out by a love for this world. And Peter remained one of them, but he overestimated his strength, and he shrank back in sin, and he was profoundly humbled by his fall. 
Now, these three portraits are instructive for us. They're helpful categories that the scriptures give to us on what we should expect to make sense of this phenomenon and to give us the language of protest when we do see leaders fall. And as much as these won't answer all the important questions, I did want to try and parse out a couple of things that I've found helpful reading through the New Testament in how to deal with this religious hypocrisy. So is religious hypocrisy, all these leaders who fall, is that a good reason to give up on the church or to leave the faith? Now, I want to say in response to this, that as percussive and as disorienting as that experience is, when someone you look up to lets you down, it's in these moments of being disoriented that we need to try and find perspective. Perspective by looking back in history and perspective by looking forward to find our bearings again. Looking back, think at what Jesus launched in the church because he desired that it would be something beautiful. When Jesus launches the church, he was designed to be the epicenter of God's work in the world, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the carriers of the Christian story, to play along in the legacy of the Lord Jesus, to this sublime tune that he composed with his life. Jesus' vision for the church, that is something worth believing in. And looking forward, even though the church has at times wandered off that script entirely, Jesus promises to make the church beautiful and a beacon of hope for the world. Something you may have already glimpsed at times in your own church community here or at other places or in the lives of Christian leaders. Picture Ephesians 5, that famed wedding text. But it promises that Jesus loves the church and lays down his life for her to present her pure and faultless, having washed her with the water of the word. He's going to beautify his church. You see the image in the book of Revelation of that heavenly city coming down, this new Jerusalem, a description of the church, of the bride of Jesus made ready for her wedding day. You think of that great promise in Philippians, that he who began a good work will carry it on to completion, or in Jude one twenty four that he is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us pure and faultless. These are the promises that he gives to us. It's a vision of the church worth believing for. So when a leader falls, this is not an expression of Christianity. It's a betrayal of Christianity. The problem with the leaders in these moments is not that they were being Christian, it's that they weren't being Christian enough. That somewhere along the lines, in their own private lives, they've grown distant from Jesus. It's something to be mourned. They stop listening to the promptings of his spirit. They may have been teaching the Bible for others, but they weren't consuming it for themselves. C.S. Lewis warned of this danger when he said that a man cannot always be defending the truth. There must come a time where he feeds on it. And so often in the lives of Christian leaders, they end up outwardly doing ministry and neglect that work of tending to their own soul in the presence of Jesus, the Spirit, and the Scriptures. And the reality that some leaders can wander away from Jesus' script in their private lives, that is no evidence for the falsehood of Christianity. All of us are still sinners, something only empirically verified by their fall. Jesus still died on the cross to save sinners. And the ultimate vindication of the truth of Christianity, the empty tomb, Jesus is still resurrected from the dead, defeating death to offer eternal life to whosoever believes. So the gospel isn't emptied of its truth by some leaders behaving badly, nor is the church so broken to be beyond Jesus' power to restore And perhaps what I found most helpful in wading through all the various questions that I raised at the beginning is being able to wrestle with two important doctrines that come to us across the entire story of the scriptures. A doctrine of sin and a doctrine of salvation. Let me start with salvation. We might want to ask the question, when we become Christians, why aren't we more different? Why doesn't God just zap us in that moment and make us perfect so that everyone is fully aware of the power of the gospel? Why isn't there just this linear growth from where you start to where you end up? Why are these moments and divots and opportunity for failure? And the answer ultimately has to do with God's end game. 
The problem of evil, why would a good God let bad things happen, is incredibly mimicked in this exploration of when leaders fall. And it's in part because God desires to have a meaningful world with meaningful creatures and a meaningful future. And that meaning, that ability for us to be active agents in the world, where what we do matters and it influences the environment around us, that ability for us to experience rich and deep relationships marked by love, all of that is dependent on a significant moral freedom that God grants to his creatures. That we don't become robots who are pre-programmed to always do exactly what God wants us to do. But that we are moral agents who move from moral immaturity and forge into our being a kind of moral maturity. It's the reason why Adam and Eve could fall in the first place. Morally innocent, but yet not morally mature. You have to learn that through a path of obedience. As every habit and decision that we make gets worn into our nature. I mean, imagine if I turned up to you on the afternoon of my wedding, two hours after the ceremony, and declared, I am morally innocent of adultery. None of you are looking at me all that impressed, right? My wife looks amazing. It's been two hours. There really hasn't been much opportunity. I haven't really been sifted by Satan at this point. But imagine if I came up to you after 50 years, and I said, I am innocent of adultery. In thought, in word, in deed, I am innocent of adultery. I've never looked at or put my hands on another woman in any way unbecoming. Like, wow, not even in your imagination. That's actually morally admirable. Why? Because for 50 years, I've been making a thousand decisions every single day that would have worn a path of fidelity into my being. I would have become a heavenly person through faithfulness to the commands of Jesus. And this pathway of his end game, of us becoming people, gardeners and governors in the new creation who will rule and reign with Jesus, hold high political office, that requires that we forge the kind of virtues, the kind of skills that are necessary for that role, which means freedom is still God's means active participation in applying what has been done for us by Jesus. Philippians 2.12 puts it this way, that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. But that gift is something that we have to apply, participate in, as we work with the Spirit to forge these new realities. And that same freedom that makes moral maturity possible is the same freedom that opens the door for leaders rather than listening to Jesus, rather than following Jesus, rather than being soft, instead to turn towards sin. The same way a doctor may ignore their own health advice and become morbidly obese or do horrendous things to their body, leaders can resist the work of the Spirit. They can shut out the word from their own soul. They can numb themselves to the Spirit's prompting in their conscience. And they can run to sinful comforts. God promises that those who come to him, he ultimately will change them. But the route that that takes, sometimes like with Peter, may involve moments of growth and then deep moments of failure. Where rather than lean into pride, they are humbled to recognize their dependence on the love and the grace of God. Doctrine of salvation and the doctrine of sin. In the modern church, we're getting really soft on the reality of sin. We explain it away. We treat it purely in therapeutic language. We pretend like it's a thing of the past. But the biblical story tells us that we have been created for good. Our desires shaped towards a love for God, a love for others, and a care for God's world. And yet we have become damaged by evil. God's good desires in us now distorted to play out in unhelpful ways and that the temptation towards sin is ubiquitous in the human experience and it's total throughout our life. There are thousands of different ways this can play out for each single person. And the good news of the gospel is that we are free from the punishment of sin, that Jesus bore our sins on his shoulders on the cross. That ugly sin of secret transgressions was made public at Calvary. And it also says that we are now free by the Spirit to no longer say yes to sin, but instead to say, no, we don't have to sin. We have the ability to stand up under temptation. 
but we still live in a world that is filled with the presence of sin and the temptation to sin. And as soon as you put people into positions of leadership, those temptations ratchet up, particularly when power's involved. It's no uh, lower known adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, none of this is an excuse for leaders who fall. The responsibility for their evil choices is entirely on them. We can't excuse those behaviors. But a healthy doctrine of sin for us as Christians, it leads us to have some seriously helpful thoughts about the church. When a healthy doctrine of sin, it means we need to be discerning in who we elevate to positions of leadership. You know, as you look through the pastoral epistles that Paul was writing to those who were setting up churches upon the Greco-Roman world, 90% of the qualifications for leadership have nothing to do with gifts and everything to do with godly character. That they're not a convert recently that you elevate quickly to leadership, that they have to be thought well of by outsiders, that they can't be easily angered or easily given to drink. They need to be able to love and serve, shepherd their own families well, that who they are needs to frame Jesus right before you ever give them a Guernsey to be able to start representing him publicly with all of the added weight that that brings. And sadly, so much of the church culture that we've built up, it values gifts over character, charisma over character, a leader who is powerful and driven and can gather crowds around them rather than someone who in the long haul is actually going to produce spiritual fruit that makes people look more like Jesus. The kind of people we should be looking up to in our life may not live the loud, spectacular, Instagrammable life. The quiet, godly people who have been faithfully following Jesus for decades on end, the ones who are happy to be in the background and serve rather than needing to be in the public eye, they might be people more worthy of our admiration. A healthy doctrine of sin means we need to be careful that we don't take those first steps into evil. Like with Judas, like with some of the Pharisees, some leaders were always wolves. And some leaders just got eaten over time by sin. Our hearts, as the great hymns remind us, they're prone to wander. We can become numb to evil. Inch by inch, that internal compass that warns us and the Spirit's prompting become broken. And we are kidding ourselves if we think that the leaders we look up to aren't just like us. Given to the same temptations, little by little. So I want to give something of a warning, maybe more for all of us on this front. To not flirt with the same sin that cost our Savior his life. Jude puts it this way, to, not, to, to hate even the clothing that is stained by sin. To take a really serious attitude towards our own individual holiness, not projecting that on others, but being careful not to let it get a foothold in our own lives. A healthy doctrine of sin means we need to set up structures that don't concentrate power. As so many of the dark revelations that have come to light is where the unique pressures of hierarchical leadership at the top meet the unique opportunities and temptations to sin that come with that power. The healthier models are those that give a plurality of leadership, that shoulder responsibility together, that are broadly accountable to their churches and that are grounded in their own individual personal lives. Now, there's going to be so much more to say to this, both at a structural and at a pastoral level, in a couple of weeks. And this is a disclaimer, I guess, if, if some of this brings up some really deep hurts for ways that you've been abused particularly, then be really, really honest in finding healthy and safe spaces to work that out with trusted professionals, with people in authority here, in dealing with some of those bigger structural questions when it comes to abuse. Stuff really needs to be worked out in the churches, but at a more base level, just to guard against hypocrisy we need to be asking the question, what kind of church culture are we promoting? Do we actually expect our leaders, the people that we look up to, to live perfect Christian lives? To have the highlights real on social media that we wish were true of our own spiritual selves? Because what comes out at the top 
is only ever a projected expectation of what we at the bottom level of the pyramid are enabling. And if we're humble, if we're honest, if we're expressing our doubts and creating a church culture that is open and safe to do that, to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, to boast all the more in our weaknesses so that grace may be celebrated more as it comes down to us. If we actually allow leaders to be honest with their struggles, we don't expect them to have it all together, but give them the freedom to take small steps where they fall and correct, autocorrect in those moments. And that's going to be a church that so much projects the immeasurable love of God in a helpful way rather than pretending like we have these perfect, already arrived lives. So we need to celebrate true humility in our leaders rather than any projection. And this is kind of where at least the final gospel invitation. Because what I most discovered when we have a healthy doctrine of sin is that we need to focus our discipleship not on anyone else, but on Jesus. The New Testament invites us to look up to leaders. The Apostle Paul himself says, imitate me. But in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In so far as I imitate Christ. Across the course of my 15 years of following Jesus, I have been tremendously blessed by spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. People who I have a deep respect for, who teach well, who love well, who counsel well, who serve well with various kinds of gifts, who have beautiful marriages, beautiful single lives, a sacrificial service towards God. People that I really do look up to. But anyone who really understands their role as a shepherd realizes that they're an under-shepherd. That their role as a leader is to point towards the voice of the good and the true and the chief shepherd. And that their best moments, they are only ever a vague echo of Jesus. That what I most admire in them is the moments where they mirror who he is. Jesus is the only one for Christians who is safe to put on any kind of pedestal. And if you're here today and you've been let down multiple times in your life, struggling to trust spiritual leaders, or structures in the church, I really do get it. There's a lot to be disillusioned by. But in that disorientation, refocus your attention to Jesus. Because we need to hear something, that there is no darkness in him. That there's never going to be some journalist or some future independent report that will unearth any unbecoming details about the Lord Jesus, that will call his character into question. And the closer you come to me, the more and more you'll be underwhelmed. I look my best from afar, right? Waxing eloquent about something else. Come and see my personal life. I was saying to Don just before, man, I wish just once in a while my wife got to introduce me when I come to speak somewhere. Because then you get a real honest and still gracious and loving window into the truth of who I am. The closer you come to me, the more you'll be disappointed. But the closer you come to Jesus, the more you will never be let down. The more you'll be amazed, as his disciples were, as the crowds were, as they saw the content of his teaching, the wonder of his miracles, but more the unique caliber of who he truly was behind closed doors. In him there is no darkness at all. If you're disillusioned with the church, with Christian leaders, I get it. But Jesus gives us a grand vision for the church, for who we individually are to become. He gives us the language of protest, to call out hypocrisy, to expose it so that it can be dealt with in the light of truth, to disinfect, to bring healing, to bring hope. He gives us a framework, this doctrine and diagnosis of sin, the temptations that are common to all of us, as well as this wonderful sense of what it means to walk out our salvation in community so that we're not left wandering in darkness when these things happen. And he gives us this profound promise that he is not done with the church. And he's not done with us. And he's not even done with those leaders who have let us down. But I hope, I genuinely pray for as many as have fallen, that they won't turn out to be Judas, nor even Demas. But like Peter, 
their fall will lead to this great humbling where they too can be restored, if not to leadership, to fellowship. The church cannot throw under the bus anyone who has ever fallen and forget that we are the same carriers of the message of grace for a world that has lost its currency for forgiveness. So let us model a different way. Let's pray. God, our Father, we want to ask that we would be a people animated by the grace of God in the gospel to diagnose evil for what it is, to call it out for the protection of those who are harmed by it, Lord, to drag it out into the light to be dealt with so the healing and hope can be restored. For those who have been hurt, Lord, would you minister to show them Jesus like with Peter at the transfiguration, to look up and see Jesus only. That their faith in him would be restored and their faith in the church would be based in the Jesus who promises that he will make it beautiful and a beacon of hope for the world. And Lord, we want to pray that as your people, we would be honest with our own sin, to drag it out, to repent, to confess our sins one to another, to be healed by the gospel, to be zealous, to cut evil out of our lives, that it wouldn't grow up as a root in darkness, to choke out our love for you, but instead that our dependence on grace, that that would grow, that we would become people marked by grace, calling out evil and extending love and forgiveness in everywhere where repentance is given. We pray that you would make that true of us as your people. And for this church here, that they would be carriers of the light of the gospel. To live as people full of the love of God. That where the church has lost its reputation in the eyes of so many, because of Christians behaving badly, that by their love, one for another, this church would prove to be true disciples of Jesus and would win back that credibility in the eyes of a world. People looking for love, looking for something real. So let us work out our salvation with fear and trembling together. For it is God who works in us, both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. We're thankful for that work. And we look to Jesus now with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our soul, and all of our strengths. And God's people said, Amen.